good, isn't it, to gather together uh, on this special day as we celebrate uh, Palm Sunday together, as we think about Jesus uh, coming into Jerusalem. I'm going to hand over to uh, somebody called James uh, in a moment uh, as we go forward. But before we do that, I have a couple of things to do for you. The first uh, is to uh, mention notices. Do not forget uh, the services this week. If you've got one of these, uh, which you should have picked up sometime in March or today, on page 11, you will see the services that we have uh, for Holy Week. If you're not sure when Holy Week is, it's this week uh, coming. So do join us for those, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, as many of them as you can. It's a really good opportunity uh, to think together, to spend a bit of time uh, in this week thinking about what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us uh, at Easter. So do join us for that uh, if you're able to do so. Uh, you'll also see a couple of other invitations, of course, uh, a warm invitation to next Sunday morning as we celebrate Easter together, a 10 o'clock uh, family service, uh, but also you'll see an invitation to uh, Adam and Eva's wedding. Uh, thank you very much. On Wednesday the 3rd of April at 12.30, there's an invitation on that uh, on today's little uh, notices and uh, some nice words. Uh, and that brings me neatly uh, on to the last thing we need to do here uh, before we allow them to get married, uh, which is to read the bands. So let me, let me publish uh, the bands of marriage between Adam Peter Heaton of St. Paul's at Leeton, and Aoife Christina O'Dowd of Christ Church Belper Parish. This is for the third time of asking. If any of you know any reason in law why these, this couple may not marry, you are to declare it to me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for Adam and Aoife. We thank you for their love for each other, and we thank you for their love for you. We pray as they uh, enter the final stage of preparations for their wedding, uh, that you will be with them, uh, give them the time and space they need to reflect as they are joined together. Be with them in their wedding day and be with them in their married life together. Amen. Palm Sunday can be a very exciting period for us. It's the beginning of Holy Week. It's the period that reminds us as Christians of the love and the sacrifice that Christ made for us. And Palm Sunday in particular is uh, it's such an exciting day as we get to return to the story of Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem. All of that excitement and joy at seeing the King of Israel uh, arriving. But our celebration this time can sometimes lead us into uh, patterns, and that joy that we felt so much each year at Easter might begin to dwindle, and perhaps a focus on chocolate eggs becomes a little bit more important. Um, however, I think it's great for us to return to that joy, that love, that excitement that comes at the heart of the Easter story. So let's begin our time of worship today by returning to that praise of the Lord that we see right at the beginning of that story. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give the answer. But this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. Let's stand and sing how deep the Father's love for us, followed by when I survey the wondrous cross.
Do please be seated. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. What a lovely song to lead us in with our worship this morning. It reminds us of, our, of that grace, that love, that mercy that God has shown for us through sending his only son to die for us. But despite our sin, our constant rejection of him, God still shows us that mercy and love, that grace. So let's take time to confess those sins to that God who has shown us such love. Let's give our moments of rejection back to the God. We're going to read the words of the confession now. Please follow along with the words in bold. They should have come up on the screen behind me. Amen. Wonderful. O King, enthroned on high, filling the earth with your glory, holy is your name, Lord God Almighty. In our sinfulness we cry to you to take our guilt away and to cleanse our lips to speak your word through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now we're going to take some time to bow our heads in prayer. <coughs> Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather together each and every week to read, to understand uh, your word, Lord, to praise your name together in unison. Lord, I pray that at the centre of our lives, not just at Easter or Christmas, Lord, that we have you there, that you are the one who guides our path and we follow the path of our King. Lord, while we speak of leaders, I pray for those who are leaders within our lives, whether that be bosses, prime ministers, kings, whoever it might be, parents, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you have your hand on them, guiding them, that they look to you for direction, and that we, Lord, those who are in that following position, that we are able to trust them in those positions and to follow along for as long as they have you at the heart of their work. Lord, well, we pray and we speak of leaders, we pray for the war that's happening in Ukraine, Lord, I pray for the leaders involved with that, for the hardship they must be going through, for the hardship of the people still suffering in that terrible period. I pray that those people, Lord, if they don't know you yet, they find you, that, Lord, you remind them, that you show them that love, the comfort that comes from certainty that we have in Christ. Lord, for those of us who we might be thinking of suffering at uh, this time of Easter, we pray for them, Lord, that you are with them, that you offer comfort, and that despite any sorrow, any struggles, any suffering, any sickness, any ailment, Lord, you are still in control. You are still there, even in the moments where we might not feel your presence at times. Lord, for those of us who might be in those moments, or those of us who might not be, I pray that we look forward to your son's return. That we look forward in those moments where we are nervous or anxious, or scared, that Lord, we have something so amazing, so divine to look forward to. <coughs> Finally, Lord, I pray that as we take time over the Easter period, Lord, I pray you remind our hearts of how we are saved and why that salvation is so important to how we live our lives as followers of you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now it's good for us to pray in unison together. Uh, so we're going to read now the words of the Lord's Prayer, which are behind me in bold. Let's say it together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. David is going to come up and give us our reading for today before we uh, will unite in song.
Today's reading is taken from John, chapter 12, beginning to read at verse 12. And the words can be found in the Pew Bibles on page 1083 or page 996 in the large print. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. Just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see, you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. This is the word of the Lord. Lovely. Thank you, David. Uh, it's almost time for us to hear what on earth James has brought in his trunk of exciting visual aids. Uh, but before we do that, before we can enjoy that excitement, let's channel all of that excitement into our next song, which has hopefully some actions that will be familiar to you. So if we all stand together, let's join in with the actions of Wide, Wide as the Ocean. <laughs> I was going to say, is that better? But it's more, can you hear me or not? Thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. And we pray as we look at this familiar passage, uh, that you'll speak to us from it. Help us to uh, reflect again on what this beginning to Easter week uh, is all about. Amen. So, uh, it's, is it Easter week or Holy Week? Uh, it depends how pedantic you want to be liturgically. Uh, it's supposed to be Holy Week, but it's kind of Easter week. So I'll use the two terms interchangeably, so don't get too worried about that uh, as we go through. So what we're going to do this morning, we're going to think about something that is probably quite familiar to us. We are thinking about Jesus coming into Jerusalem. However, we have some visual aids to help us. Now, it's possible that the build-up was a little bit, uh, a little bit more than needed, okay? Uh, I, I may be about to disappoint you, but I do have some visual aids to help us through the story, okay? So that is exciting in and of itself, isn't it? 
Thank you. First visual aid. You ready? Thank you very much. So this is a palm cross, okay? It's a palm cross because it's Palm Sunday, okay? And it's Palm Sunday because, ooh, thank you, because people were, not crosses, because that, no, people, and not this small either, because that would have been a bit kind of, you know, a bit naff, wouldn't it? But because people waved big palm branches, okay? This is our first. This is why we call it Palm Sunday, because as Jesus came into Jerusalem, palm crosses, palm branches were waved. And we need to think, first of all, about why that was. Why is it that people were doing that? So let's have a look at this passage, and let's look at this first verse. This is John chapter 12, verse 12. If you want to follow it through, it's on the screen, or it's on page 1083. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. Now, we've been working through Mark over the last few uh, weeks, haven't we? Back all the way back till January. We've been working through Mark 7 to 10. So we've skipped forward a little bit to chapter 12, which means we've skipped forward about a year, give or take. Okay? So we're a little bit later on in the story. But we're used to this, aren't we? We know about this. We know that when Jesus is in Jerusalem, it tends to create a bit of a fuss. Yes? Okay? It's generally quite a lot happens when Jesus is in Jerusalem. And so the crowd has heard that Jesus is coming, and he's not been in Jerusalem for a while. So there's a level of excitement. What's going to happen next? Okay? Because we also know that when Jesus comes, it was in Jerusalem last time, in chapter 7 to 10, there was a level of jeopardy. That is, there was quite a lot of people who weren't terribly happy that Jesus was there. And if we were reading the back end of chapter 11 of John, we'd find that that's still going on. That whilst there are some people excited to see Jesus come, there are some people who are not so keen on the whole idea at all. And so Jesus is coming to Jerusalem, and that creates an expectation. What's going to happen next? So what's the first thing that happens? Clue is in the palm cross. What happens is Jesus enters Jerusalem. Okay, don't make me do this for too long. Come on, help me out here. What happens is Jesus, do you you want to tell me what happens? What happens when Jesus is in Jerusalem? Do people wave things? Yes, yes, Nancy. They wave palm leaves, exactly. They wave palm leaves, don't they? So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Now, why palm branches? Okay. Why palm branches? Well, actually, waving palm branches in first century Jerusalem was a little bit like when you see those processions and the royal family goes past and people are waving those tiny little union flags. You know the kind of thing? Yeah? I remember uh, driving years ago, 2012 I think it was, I, I, we, we, I was driving somewhere and we happened to be driving along the route of the Olympic torch before the Olympic torch arrived. It took me a little while to realize that the crowds weren't for me. Uh, but anyway, uh, we, there was lots of people sort of waiting expectantly on the side of the road with those little flags ready to celebrate, to celebrate something about being British, something about English, whatever that means. Those palm branches were a national symbol. They were all about Israel, about national identity. Now, what's complicated about Israel's national identity in the first, don't, not 21st, Okay, let's not get into that. In the first century, what's complicated about it? Or to put the question in another way, who's in charge in Jerusalem in the first century? The Romans, thank you very much. The Romans. So there's a little bit going on here, isn't there? Can you imagine that? Here is Jesus into Jerusalem, and here are the people waving palm branches, which is a symbol. They did that a few couple of hundred years before when a Another great Israelite leader came in to free them from oppressors. And so here is Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And so they're shouting out, Hosanna, which means, anybody know? Go on, go on, Nancy. 
My aim is not, oh, I thought you were going to tell me. That's all right. Don't worry. Just put your hand up to tease me. Tease me. Save us. Save us. Hosanna, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed, even the king of Israel. So here, as the crowd cheers for Jesus, they are cheering for a king. And they're cheering for a king, waving their palm branches, waving their palm branches for the king because they want a king who's going to free them from the Romans. Just repeat your last answer, it's fine. From the Romans, okay? So that's certainly some of the crowd have got an expectation about Jesus is going to be this king. So we can already see that although Jesus is coming in Jerusalem, it's a bit more complicated than it looks, isn't it? Because we know already that there are people who aren't that keen to have him there. And we also know that the people who want him there are want him there for their own reasons. It's all a little bit complicated. But we do get palm branches for a king. Now, let me ask you a question, okay? The answer to this question is yes. Uh, is Jesus the king? Yeah, good. Okay, well done. So Jesus is a king. Is he the kind of king that they were expecting? No, good. So there we are. This is you doing really well. So there we are. This is the thing, isn't it? But Jesus is a king. He's the king, but he's a very particular kind of king. And that brings us to our, vis- our, our second visual aid. Now, this is the only one that's even vaguely impressive, okay? So uh, get excited about this one. Are you ready? Okay, now, for the purposes of this story, okay, what animal is this? It it is a donkey. To be fair, he's usually a donkey. Uh, He's the donkey that may not have appeared at Christmas, but he's the donkey that definitely came at Easter, okay? He is a donkey. And why have I got a donkey in my hand? Thank you, okay? There's so many other possible answers, weren't there? Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Now, What is significant about a donkey as a means of transport? What is it not? What was the the answer? A horse. Did someone say, oh, you said a horse. Did anybody else say a horse? I don't even know what yours said. It's not a horse. Now, what kind of people ride on horses? Kings, important people, knights, yes? Knights on horseback. Did anybody sort of charge into battle with a lance by his side and a sword in his hand on a donkey? No, okay? So donkeys are not the kind of thing that kings ride on, are they? All right? Useful utility animals. Not really terribly impressive. So Jesus' decision to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey is very deliberate. Now, John summarizes the story for us. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Now, Jesus summarized the story. If you remember from the other Gospels, there's a long bit about that, isn't there? Uh, where shall I put Dobbin? There we are. Stay. Okay, good. Uh, there's a long bit in the other Gospels about the donkey and, and untying it and all the rest of it. That's fine. John doesn't sort of include that, not because he doesn't know it happens, but because he wants to focus on what the donkey points towards. Okay? He wants to focus us in on this passage that he starts quoting in verse 15. Now, where's that passage from? Come on. You know this one. This is Zechariah 9, verse 9, okay? Zechariah 9. Look, this footnotes. You should be able to look at the footnotes of nothing else, okay? Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. This is a passage, and this passage is a little bit of uh, Isaiah 40, verse 9 in there as well. That maybe is what confused you. Uh, but uh, this is a passage that, that, that is very deliberately quoted here so that we can understand what kind of king Jesus is. Let's have it. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud. O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So here is this picture from in the, back in the Old Testament, around right about 400 years, give or take, before Jesus came. Okay? Uh, in the prophet Zechariah, the prophet looks forward to a time where the king, the son of David, the messianic king, will come into Jerusalem Riding on a donkey. So that's unusual. On the colt of a donkey, the foal of a donkey. And look how that king comes in. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey. Now, if you go through all the words 
that you might use to talk about kings. You might talk about powerful. You might hopefully talk about righteous. You might talk about wealthy. You might talk about important. Those kinds of words, yes? Yes, okay? I suspect if we paid king word association for a little while, okay? So there's children talk waiting to happen, isn't it? As we pay, if we paid king word association for a while, one of the words that would not come up is humble. It's not the kind of word we associate with a king, is it? Of course, when we think about it, yes, it is a good word for a king. But it's probably not the word that comes to mind first of all. And yet this is one of the words that is emphasized in this passage from Zechariah 9. Look at verse 10. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Here is the humble king, and the humble king comes to bring peace. So this king who's coming into Jerusalem is not like the kings of the nations. He's not like those Roman kings who bring peace with a sword. He is the one who brings peace by destroying the artifacts of war, the war horse and the battle bow. He brings peace for Jerusalem, but he also brings peace for the nations. This isn't just a king who's come to make the people of Jerusalem happy. This isn't a king who's come to kick the Romans out. This is the king who has come to bring peace. Here is the king who is coming into Jerusalem, who will bring peace, who will shed blood. Of course he will. But the blood that's shed is his own blood. This is the king who's coming into Jerusalem to die, to die for his people in all humility, to bring peace, to bring the peace that we need most of all, which, of course, is not the peace between the Israelites and the Romans, but is the peace between us and God. That's the peace we need most of all, isn't it? And that's the peace that we can have in Jesus Christ. That's what this story is all about, isn't it? The king who comes into Jerusalem to live and to die for his people to take the punishment we deserve, to die on the cross, which is why, of course, our palm is a palm cross, to die on the cross for our sake, for our sins. So here is the king, but not the king you're expecting, the king who brings peace. And that brings us to our final object. Actually, this one might be reasonably exciting. Are you ready? Easter eggs, yes? Okay. So our third object, I wonder how many there are. Oh, there's a few in here. Okay, there's a few left. So if anybody's good, you can have an egg. I've been good. Right. Uh, for the king who brings peace, there is one other thing we need to do with this story. Okay. So we got to the middle of it. We've understood that there's a king. We've understand that this is, understood that this is a different kind of king. This is the king who brings peace. But then we need to understand something else. Okay. We need to understand a little bit about responses. You see, here is the Easter gift, okay? This is a gift. I suspect there will be some eggs exchanged in houses next week. Yes, I'm ever hopeful. Next Sunday, Easter Sunday, chocolate, just in case anybody's uh, unsure what we're supposed to do with that, uh, apparently. Uh, so there we are. So there'll be some Easter eggs uh, next week. Uh, uh, and why? Well, because it's Easter and we give gifts. And what's the gift all about? Well, look, first of all, uh, at John chapter 12, verse 16. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. So here is the gift, the gift of Jesus Christ who comes and lives and dies and rises again at Easter. How do we respond to that gift? Well, here are the disciples. The disciples do not quite get it at the time. Now, when it says the disciples don't realize what's going on, as we know from the Gospels, it doesn't mean that they didn't understand anything about it. It means that they didn't understand everything about it. That full understanding 
of what this was all about didn't come until after Jesus Christ had, ri- had died and risen again. That's no great surprise. But then, of course, we read that having understood, they received the gift. They received the gift, didn't they? They didn't understand. They remembered after he was glorified. So that's one response to the gift. The gift is received, okay? Is that a good response to a gift? Yes, yes. Well done. Yes, it is. Right, let's have a look at another response. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they they heard he had done this sign. Now, that first verse, verse 17, is reasonably positive about the crowd, isn't it? The crowd bearing witness, well, that's what you're supposed to do. That's what uh, the job of Jesus' followers is, is to be witnesses. That's what we are. We're witnesses to what Jesus Christ has done. We bear witness. That is, we tell other people. Simple, okay? But verse 18 adds a little bit of a wrinkle, doesn't it? Do you see that? The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they'd heard he'd done this sign. Hmm. Because we've seen that before in John, haven't we? We've seen the way that the crowd sometimes responds to the sign because the sign is impressive. Not always responding to what the sign signifies. It's a little bit like being on the motorway, wanting to go towards London, and uh, wanting to go towards London and seeing a sign saying London that way and thinking, well, that's very interesting, but not necessarily going and following the sign. Signs point somewhere, don't they? They're in themselves. They don't really tell you anything very much. So, the sign, okay? So, I think this one is the gift consumed. And I was sort of had a sort of chocolate, chocolate sense about it. The gift consumed, yes? Sometimes Easter eggs are consumed uh, without much thought. Is that, is that true? I mean, not in your, I know not in any of your houses. Okay, I know that wouldn't happen. But, but it, uh, some other people, uh, not that obviously aren't here this morning, might do that, mightn't they? Yes? And it would be possible, wouldn't it, to miss what that was about in the middle of the chocolate frenzy. We can understand that, can't we? Okay? So that's one way to respond to this gift, is to actually to consume it without really considering what it's actually about. Without really thinking it through. Is that a good response? No. Okay? There's a mix. There's a, there's a, there's, there's the division in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, the uh, house of the Adam and Eve household, which doesn't bode well. Uh, Ten days away from a marriage. But there we go. We'll we'll resolve that later. Okay, finally. All right, one more response. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that they're gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. And I think we can recognize here, can't we? Because we've seen this before. That this is the gift being rejected. As far as they're concerned, the fact that all these people are interested in what Jesus is saying and interested in what Jesus is doing is a problem. There's an irony here, of course, there always is in John, isn't there? The world has gone after him. They mean it as a term of abuse and a term of disappointment. But actually, thankfully, it's starting to be true. Because the whole world will go after Jesus uh, as people come to hear the good news of Jesus. And again, it's not just the Pharisees, is it? Because this crowd that on uh, on Palm Sunday, we celebrate the crowd rejoicing in Jesus entering Jerusalem. This crowd, some of this crowd will still be present a few days later. And they will be some of the people, perhaps, who are shouting, crucify, crucify, and calling to free Barabbas and to let Jesus be killed. But the irony is, even though the gift is rejected, the gift is still the gift. The gift doesn't stop being the gift because people won't receive the gift. It's still a gift. And it's still a gift that's offered, isn't it, to the whole world. The gift of Jesus Christ coming, the King who brings peace, who dies on the cross for our sins, that gift is still being presented. The fact that people reject the gift doesn't stop the gift being the gift of life. That's important for us, isn't it, as we offer that gift to others, to recognize that whatever the response others give to this gift, we still offer that gift because it is a gift. So, we have this gift We've seen it received, we've seen it consumed, we've seen it rejected. We have to finish with this question. What about this gift for us? What are we planning to do with Easter this year? Okay, what are we planning to do with Easter this year? What are we planning to do with Jesus this year? What do we need to do with Jesus this year? Maybe for some of us, it's a case of saying, actually, do you know what? I do actually need to spend a bit of time thinking about this. Life rushes by, we know that. 
There are myriad things that we could be doing. There are myriad ways that take up our time. Do we have some time so that we can just slow down a little bit and think about what Jesus did for us? So that we might draw close again to the Lord. So that we might rejoice again in the one who made that sacrifice for us. So that we might be comforted that this person loves us so much, so much, that he's willing to come and live and die for us and rise again for us. Let's draw near to that gift, draw near to that truth. Receive again the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or maybe this Easter we need to receive that grace and mercy for the first time. The, this story that we've perhaps rejected or perhaps consumed is a gift that we need to receive. That we need to recognize that the way to God isn't by us trying to be better and better and better than we are already. But the way to God is to receive that Jesus Christ came and did it for us. That the king brings peace through his death on the cross. That we can receive peace with God as a gift. A gift and a calling. A promise. A grace. That will transform our lives. And begin to make us more and more the people that God has called us to be. Maybe we need to receive that gift this morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you uh, for the way that you encourage us as we think about Palm Sunday. As we rejoice and remember Jesus entering Jerusalem. We thank you so much uh, for all that he did for us. Amen. I've got five chocolate eggs. If anyone wants to come and be nice to me at the end of the service, they can probably have one. Okay. Uh, we're going to finish. Uh, we're going to sing a hymn which is all about Palm Sunday. Ride on, ride on in majesty. Let's stand and sing together. Please sit down. Uh, do join us after the service. Refreshments, tea and coffee will be served over there. Some trays will come around as well, so you can wait uh, for it to come to you. Uh, please, on your way out, or early if you wish, uh, do pick up palm crosses. There are palm crosses for everybody, so please do pick up. It's a good opportunity to think about uh, Easter, uh, both the uh, shape of the 
uh, palm and also the palm itself. Uh, and of course, do take an opportunity uh, to pray with brothers and sisters in the Bradshaw area at the end of the service, uh, if you wish. As we close, we finish with the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this Palm Sunday and always.